Okay, do we see the story on Cain and Abel? And many of us know that there's a lot of theology behind the story, but I want to look at the story as a counselor, and we want to cover some of the principles that we've talked about here in the class so far. Um, the first one has to do with the counselor. We drew a uh, picture last time on um, the man, the man or the woman of God having relationships. Do you remember this? His relationship with God, which was called the vertical. Then he ministers to people. And this is something you're going to grow in as believers, that when you are with people, you have uh, actually two things that are happening to you just as a believer in Christ. Well, the first one is in your heart. Uh, you have a new heart, and therefore you also have uh, aim or goal. You have direction in your life. In John 8, verses, uh, is it verse 12? I am the light of the world. He that follows me will walk in the light of life, not in darkness. First issue as a believer is, do you have some direction in your life? you have a goal or an aim as a believer? You know, that's a good question. And I'm going to let you think about it for a minute and also talk, because I like that kind of activity in the classroom, because we're going somewhere and what we want to say tonight. A counselor has some sense of direction that is given to him from God by the Holy Spirit. And he's actually going somewhere. He is growing in his faith, and therefore he becomes like Jesus. And the big question, when Jesus was with people, was he leading them? Was he, was he going somewhere? Did he have a, a goal? Did he have a direction in his life? Um, turn to John uh, chapter Eight with me, and let's read it. Let's see if I got it right. Verse 12 or verse 15. I always get the two uh, confused. Yeah, verse 12. I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but ha shall have the light of life. Do you have that light of life? Are you walking in darkness? Are you going somewhere and have a general sense of where you're going? I don't mean geographically, where am I going? Am I going to Libya? Am I going to New York? Am I going to Towson? I mean, in my heart, am I going somewhere? Do I sense and feel direction that comes from God in my heart? And maybe as a new believer, like some of you are, you, you um, only live, know that you are because you live in faith. And it isn't so obvious to you always. Like, how much do you know? And many, many of us would say, you know, I really don't know much. Um, where are you going? I'm not exactly sure. Um, could you be a counselor? Hmm. Uh, I could tell somebody where to buy ice cream, but I don't know how much I can help them find the solution to their problems and even more deeply tell them how to live their life. But actually, this is what happens to you as a believer. You grow in this. Remember this diagram we gave uh, about the cliff, you know, this na narrow way? and a few there be that find it. And the believer is, 
actually going and what is the what is that narrow way that is maturity in Christ it is his mind it's abundant life it's amazing do you know that you are going there you are because uh, this is what Jesus promised us and in the body we mature in him, grow up in him, in his headship. When you start in Bible school, you're not sure about that. But in time, you realize that, wow, there is, there is something going on in my mind and in my heart. It is so. So you become uh, capable. The set, third thing that Jesus had with people was contact that you have also is contact. <clears throat> Your heart now with direction in fellowship and then you're with people. By contact, I mean contact with people. I mean you are you are learning to look at people. You are learning to relate to them. You're learning to be a friend to them. You're learning to listen to them. This is the development that, you, that is going on in your life that makes you and I counselors. Now, in this first diagram here, this first one, this is more like a, a general uh, relationship with other people, with general with people. You have an influence on them. You could be in a car with people, and you, could, you are, in a sense, a, um, a communicator. You love people in your heart. You uh, fellowship if they are believers. If they are not believers, you're able to uh, uh, have an influence with them, communicate with them, share your life with them, love them. Who did this with unbelievers and was very good at it? Who was very good at making contact with unbelievers? Jesus, Jesus was. Jesus was very good at contact with unbelievers. And we could go through a list of them. Let's do it short, just. His first, uh, there was, these were not unbelievers, but the people when he met Andrew and Peter, who were disciples of John the Baptist, then he met Nathaniel, he met Peter again and they became followers. There was Nicodemus, who was not a believer, but had good questions, John 3. The woman at the well in John 4, and she was not a believer. The man at the pool of Bethsaida in John 5. Um, his own family, John 7. Uh, the blind man, John 9. Um, he was a friend of publicans and sinners, the prostitute in Luke 7, verse 37. Um, Zacchaeus was in a tree in Luke 19, not a believer, but Christ had contact. And he, he cared because the contact was the evidence of the mind, the mind of God seeking those that are lost and caring for them. A counselor, um, we, could, we could go on in this. Let, let, let's stop here for a second. Before we counsel Cain, which we'll look at in Genesis chapter 4, let's look at the anatomy of a counselor for a moment. We, we have uh, this picture of a counselor and the counselee, and uh, Plato has this idea, a teacher and a student, and they are sitting on a log, 
a drawing is not good, but the log, log is the environment. And one is a student, and the other one is a teacher. When we talked to Cain to counsel him about his problems with his brother Abel, um, we will be in an environment. We will also ourselves have a mind and a heart and a sense of direction. What do you want to say to Cain? Where do you want to bring Cain? What do you want to do for Cain? It's very hard for me to know what to give him and how to help him if I myself haven't understood what I'm really after in my life. And this is what happens in your life when you, when you believe and you start your walk of faith. You actually become knowledgeable and you also have skill or training or learning and then you also um, have gifts. So we're going to look at the teacher, the, the counselor, and then we're going to look at the student tonight. OK, so first the counselor. You can make it really simple. Three parts, the experience of the believer, the counselor, his experience. How can I really help Cain unless I myself have experienced the, the actual, the freedom, the personal experience, the hope, the encouragement, and the wisdom that Cain needs has to come in my life by way of my knowledge here, one part of the pie, knowledge. And then I have, as a, as a believer, skill. We could put here talent or gift. Okay. This is a great little picture here. What, is a, what does a counselor need in order to help somebody out of their trouble and move on in maturity? And how, what, is it, what do we need by, from that, that's in our lives that we are able to impart to others? We have the... We, have knowledge, and this is what we're gaining by studying the Bible. It is an amazing resource of wisdom and knowledge. We grow in it, Colossians 1, 9 to 11. Then we have in our lives experience. This is Romans 5, verse 5. And then God gives us gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we have a list of them, 5 through verse 7. What are some of the gifts that the spirit that are given to us as body members? Gifts of knowledge, wisdom, um, gifts of faith, of mercy, Romans 12. And it, as a believer, God equips us to be counselors for people that have real deep problems, like Cain does. Cain has got real serious trouble that begins like it's in his heart. His problem is in his heart. His depression, the feeling of being rejected, the sense of alienation, that easily morphs into jealousy regarding his brother, and then uh, his hatred, 
and then he acts it out, and he murders his brother. But if we could be counselors to Cain before he acts out his emotional trouble, uh, maybe we would be saving a man from um, a multitude of sins. Turn to James and read that with me. James 5, verse 20, verse 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, wow, what a verse. Hey, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, well, Cain was not a brother. Um, and here we have restoration. But it can also be applied to an unbeliever if he is saved. Look at verse 20. Excuse me, 20. Let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his way. Here's a good question. Can I? I mean, God does it, but can I be used by God to convert a sinner from the error of his way? Well, how could I be equipped uh, for such a mission? And how, how could God use me? In one hand, he can use anybody with very little training, very little experience, very little knowledge but a pure heart and the power of the Holy Spirit using his word. On the other hand, we're learning that really, if we live the life over a period of time, we will become skillful, knowledgeable, and experienced. And can, I mean, this is amazing to park here for a minute. I mean, are there people that are really changed by the counsel that comes from the Holy Spirit, can God really change a person and really set them free? And of course, Jesus is the answer, and we, we are, are saying that Jesus was uh, knowing where he was going. He had an amazing understanding of doctrine, infinitely so, but he also learned it. He was learning John 7, 17, you shall know of the doctrine that I teach that it is not from me, but you will know that it is what it is. You will know it as being true because it is not from me, but from my Father. And you will know because in John 8, 32 to 36, it will liberate you, set you free. So Jesus had the doctrine, the wisdom, the truth. He had the direction, and he had the ability to contact people. And I love this thought of the contact with people, like he cared about them, and he labored for them. He cared about them, and when he had the contact, we have it written in the scripture, he knew how to listen to them, and he knew how to teach them. And many times he would go from concrete things as a point of contact with people. And then he would go to the more abstract or the spiritual. That's a good point. Jesus and contact with people. It was material, physical, stories, Examples, parables, very simple. A man had two sons. So right there, you're in the story. A man had two sons. But he's going to speak about the kingdom, the spiritual, and he would give the counsel. And they would be, sometimes um, they would just be, not have, they would not have a clue of what he was talking about, but they followed him. And uh, other times, the, the Pharisees, they knew he was talking about them in Luke 15, and they were also very angry. So uh, the point is, 
that you, you are learning to have contact with people. Let's stop there for a second. I want to ask you a question. Are you shy? Is it difficult to have contact with people? Do you talk much? Are you quiet? Um, are you indifferent to people? Are you um, not caring? Not caring about people? Are you uh, insecure socially and otherwise? Okay. What, what's the answer to these questions? If you're young, probably the answer is yes. I am a bit insecure, I am a bit shy, I am inexperienced. It, in a way, is very healthy. You know how, how dumb you are, okay, and me. We are, okay. Kind of joking a little bit, but that's okay. To be shy, to be insecure, to be not so confident about things. I don't want to be a, a person talking like Job's three friends who are giving advice when they don't know what they're talking about. But I'm not talking about advice, I'm talking about contact. Would you rather be alone? I think there's a time to be alone. But you have to learn, you and I need to learn to be with people. Because the Holy Spirit does lead us to be with people. And we are with people that love us, and then we are also with people that don't know us. And uh, this is a part of, of uh, learning and growing up as a person. And so challenge your flesh by being with people. Sometimes people I don't know, and even people that I feel awkward around, or people that uh, I'm not comfortable with. Uh, it is all a part of learning uh, socially and spiritually. It's the Holy Spirit, of course, is what we're interested in. God will lead you and guide you in uh, personal uh, ministry to people. And when you become, as we said last night in our service here, God-conscious, it was a great night last night, service time. And we spoke about praise and also prayer and not being self-conscious. Okay? It's like learning to minister, learning to serve, learning to communicate, not just simply with your friends, or people that you know, but learning to have contact with people. Uh, this is a, is, this is a uh, skill that you learn uh, in the ministry. Okay, uh, so I asked uh, you to uh, talk about that for a moment, okay? And it is this, uh, do you find it difficult uh, to be with people, and do you find it difficult to minister to people? Okay. <laughs> I guess it's a yes-no question, but <laughs> go ahead, talk for a minute on that. Okay. <clears throat> what are some of the things, uh, what are some of the things, uh, let's say it this way. I might be shy, I might be insecure, but I want, I want to be useful. My life is not my own. I want to be a communicator and I want to care. Is that right? Okay, if you have a problem with that, then you can see me after this class, okay? That I want, here's a short list, I want to be helpful. I'm not, this is not about the, the counselor's ego. It is simply he wants to be helpful, Galatians 6.1. A lot of counseling isn't happening in a formal setting, in an office with two chairs. A lot of counseling, as with Jesus, happened in the countryside, 
marketplace, on the Sea of Galilee, and so on. And we realize this, that a lot of good counsel happens like in, a, in, in beautiful moments of exchange and connection with people. Uh, I want that because it says that the, that the words of the wise feed many and that the mouth of the wise is a well of life, Proverbs chapter 10. And, and you will benefit. You lie down at night thinking about what you said, and it was from the Holy Spirit. And you go, wow, that was from the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. And then you like chew on it. You think about it as you're falling asleep. That was amazing. Those are words of wisdom, apples of gold and pictures of silver. And it's coming from your new heart. The new heart is important in our understanding theologically. We have a new heart, the heart of David, the heart of Jesus Christ. So we want to be helpful, Galatians 6. 1. Number two, we love 1 Corinthians 13. We have a heart of love. Then we have knowledge, 1 Corinthians 8, 2, and 3. And James 3, we have wisdom from above. Another thing, we'll get into it a little bit more, maybe, but when I am a counselor, as a counselor, my, my, um, my interest in them, as I'm listening, as I set maybe an appointment with Cain, Cain has a problem, or maybe I've stumbled into Cain, uh, and, we, and we have a talk, and I am... Um, I'm listening to him, my body language, and in my eyes, and as I listen to him, and I am praying, and I'm thinking about what is the real problem here, what is Cain's real problem. So, um, the counselor, there's some things it can say about uh, uh, the counselor in a more formal setting in the office. Like if he's sitting in his chair, he's just kind of like eating, throwing down potato chips and leaning back and not looking, not caring. But if he, is, uh, if he has a counseling session, a time of listening and investigating, he has to collect data and investigate what we're talking about. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. You know, what am I looking for when I talk to the counselee about their problem? Um, have they made the appointment? We make the appointment, or they have made the appointment. We have, we have a counseling time, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, talk about that. So the counselor, the spiritual experience, the skill, the training, the knowledge, the appearance of the counselor, and then the environment of the, of the exchange. Is it confidential? Usually when people talk about their problems, they don't have a microphone in their hand, and they're not throwing it up on the internet. Actually, they do do that a lot. Uh, but you know, when you, confidentiality is important, and so you have an environment, can we talk here, or would you be more comfortable talking, you know, more privately? This is semi-private, but somebody could walk in, and uh, you have um, restaurants, streets, park benches, bus, car, um, a room, uh, uh, church room uh, with windows where it's it's also people can see what is happening inside the room for the sake of um, the um, integrity of the meeting. And then is there quiet? Is there background noise and or not? And do the do, does the counselee know that or believe that you're going to be confidential with what they're sharing with you. There are a lot of people that don't ask questions. I don't know the percentages, but 
to give you an idea, if you have 100 people, half of them will not, get help, will not ask for help. Uh, the, no help. Uh, they they do not they they are not seeking any help no help and half of them solve their problems by themselves okay this is something i don't know if it's true but it, the the numbers are not the point but the concept is and and um and i don't you know i've read a few things and I'm not convinced about the numbers, but out of 100 people, 50 of them don't ask for help, but half of them solve their problems themselves, okay? Then the other people that ask for help, half of them get the help, and the other half don't have their problems solved. When they ask for help, they don't get their problems solved. So, um, you know, the, the point is, so we could do something like this. I hope you can understand the diagram. The point is that um, the reason why I don't like these numbers is because we, we, are, we are not ministering to people on a secular level. We have a lot of help from God as believers. And I believe that a lot of people, a lot more believers, if we drew this diagram for the believer, if you have 100 people that have problems, uh, the church life does a lot of counseling and a lot of help for people. So I say, go to church. If 100 people have problems, 100 believers have problems, I say trust God, go to church, and the body of Christ will minister. And also the doctrine will, will come to your heart and mind, and your problem may not be solved, but you're able to live with it. That's one, one part of what happens. My problem is still there, but it's different now because I am empowered by God in my life, by God's grace. I'm growing in my spiritual life. Don't you have a problem, a marriage problem? Yeah, I do, but it's different now because I'm getting the counsel from God that is teaching me how to live with that. And I, am, I, am a, I feel that this is okay for me. I would love it to change, but I don't know how that will happen exactly. Maybe I will go and get help someday with a counselor, but right now I'm able to live with it, pray for my husband or my wife, and this type of approach. So I think the numbers, if, if a Christian, in other words, Christians that need help or need counsel have to decide themselves how much they seek uh, specific counsel. We had a session today, very interesting, and I'm very happy the people came for counsel. And um, they have to decide themselves if they are coming in for counsel, and um, uh, it's a big thing, I think, because they're going to put their life out there in front of somebody. And when I counsel, I always have another pastor with me. Uh, and the reason is because I'm not always available. And if there needs to be follow-up, the other pastor can do it. And the second reason is because we, I think we, we are very effective together and with the person. We're not talking a lot, but really looking for and listening and trying to understand and that other pastor can hit the mark and really come, really bring it, you know, and I just heard that, and I think I was part of that process today as we were both together listening, and I, I uh, started in my, what was in my heart, what I wanted to say to them. We listened, and then the other pastor really hit, hit a home run, and, um, you know, in my opinion, it was very well done. 
So that's beautiful. So there are many Christians, I think, that do have problems that need to be addressed in a specific way, uh, and they do not go anywhere. They don't go to the church, and they don't go for counsel. Um, there's the uh, church life. When we say the pulpit is our counselor, we, we say that here, and it is really true. I I recognize it in my own life. I've gotten so much counsel, thousands of hours, really, tens of thousands of hours of, of, of counsel from the teaching. And you never know how that is going to play out in your life in a personal way. It'll be amazing. You like learn things, and the way you know it is because when you look in the world and hear about the problems people have, you think, oh, they should have gone to Bible school. You know, I mean, oh, wow, what a mess. They, there, there are certain um, uh, problems that people have, and I just don't see how um, they could know otherwise, because in the public school, they're not going to learn about, about um, how to handle their emotions. Um, and the, they, they might be told to behave, but they do not know how to handle the problems that are servicing, that is servicing in their sinful nature. That Mark 7, 21 and 23. Okay, so um, we've got uh, the counselor, the environment of the counseling session, and now the counselee. So uh, soon we'll be getting to Cain, because he's got to sit on our, on our uh, counseling bench and hear some words from us, because he's going to get in a lot of trouble in a few weeks or months or years. He's going to end up killing his brother, and that's not good. Murder is not a solution to my trouble, okay? So are, we, are you with me now? We'll, we'll take a break. Hey, why not take a break? Hey, let's celebrate. Let's take a break. All right, go, go have a coffee. Go, go celebrate. Go take a break.